worked. Thank you. Welcome back. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the May 7th, 2018 Salisbury City Council work session. First up on the agenda is uh, Laura Soper with accepting DHCD grant funds for the National Folk Festival. Hi, Laura. How are you? Well, in front of you guys, you have a resolution accepting funding from the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development Main Street Improvement Grant Program. Uh, the funding is in the amount of $25,000 and will be utilized to provide funding for the National Folk Festival to fund stipends for various coordinators associated with the festival, some of their work expenses, some of Caroline's office expenses. Um, and essentially, we're also looking at uh, an MOU that we'd like to enter into with the a &E Care of National Folk Festival to transition some of those funds over there so that they can be expended. Does anyone have any questions? No. Questions? OK. Yeah. Thank you. Bring it on. Thank you. We read our, no, we no read, questions? we read no. our, you we read our stuff. We read our stuff. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Fear the day. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have uh, street closures, a discussion. Ms. Pollock, how are you? Good afternoon. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. This first item is to talk about some possible street closures on Route 13 where the streets intersect um, around the S-curve area. So as you know, State Highway Administration is doing a drainage project on Route 13. Uh, the next phase will go from where they ended near South Boulevard north towards Main Street. And as part of that project, we've been working with State Highway for years to look at the plans and to talk about how, how things will change, what sidewalks will look like, crosswalks, that type of thing. So. In that, we started a discussion of a particular South Division Street because near the S curve, South Division Street on the east side is, is a challenging access point. We have the delineators in the center lane to keep people from going left, but it's still people um, go off onto, make a right onto that street very quickly and pull onto Route 13 very quickly at that area. So it's, it's just, um, it's been a safety concern, something we've looked at. So the, the idea came about, should we close South Division Street's access to Route 13 on both the east and west side in that area to provide a safer corridor there? And one of the driving factors is that we do have a signalized intersection at Vine Street. So if we end up closing it there, we're, we're not inconveniencing uh, vehicular traffic necessarily. They can go one block over to Vine Street and be able to go north or south on Route 13. State Highway is willing to put in the curb gutter and sidewalk as part of their drainage project. So if we agree to this, when they come through and, and tear up the road as they did further south on Route 13 and put in new storm drains, when they replace the sidewalk curb and gutter, they will replace it where, these, where the street openings are now. Um, then it led to a discussion on Mitchell Street because it's not used very much. It's really only feeding um, parking lots and, and a lot of PRMC's parking areas. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really the, in the similar condition. It would be a, a prime candidate to close that access point off uh, for safety reasons and again direct vehicles towards Vine Street or some other direction. So if we, if we proceed with this, there's, there's a map included in your package. So on, on Route 13's frontage, State Highway would add curb gutter sidewalk. On Mitchell Street, the city would install bollards there and then on um, South Division Street, we would also put sidewalk ourselves on the east side of the railroad tracks and then on the, on the west side of the other South Division Street crossing. We would continue the sidewalk so that there's not gaps since that really wouldn't be a road there anymore. So that, that is the proposal for your consideration. My only question is uh, EMS and fire. Okay. Have we discussed mm -hmm. it with them? Actually, we have not, but I, I can do that. I sure. would because from experience mm -hmm. coming in, you can tell sometimes when Vine gets backed up. Okay, sure. And, it's a, and there is no problem with an ambulance once they get around there, mm -hmm. lights and sirens stopping and then proceeding. 
So my only question would be, I think it would be behoove us to uh, check with fire department and see if there's any impact. Certainly, we can do that. All right. Mm -hmm. If there's any way possible, we can get any police reports from that particular mm -hmm. area as well. Normally yeah. it's a, a need arises because mm -hmm. if, if it's really about getting on Route 13 too fast either way, then I can't imagine anybody in the room is not guilty of it. Um, is there any concern from your standpoint or from our standpoint that the only access to Waverly Drive at that point is all the way back at Middle Boulevard? I, I understand mm -hmm. we're, we're supposed mm -hmm. to use places where there's lights to get places, but right. genetically that's <laughs> not how we're born here in Salisbury. <laughs> we're trying to get there as fast as we can without having to take a left. Oh, yeah, right. sneak through the hospital. Or sneak through, yeah, absolutely. Yes. So I just, if, if this one, and I understand it's an opportune time to do it if they're, they're redoing everything underneath there, but just because they'd be willing to do it for us and they're sure. doing curb and gutter, Mm -hmm. To me, those are some very historically significant roads that come to our city. There's a lot of history there. Mm -hmm. And if the hospital is going to open back up this section here at the top of Division Street when they tear down the old building in the hopes of going through again, mm -hmm. you have some, you have, and, and that was always my understanding that that's what they were going to do. Yeah, I think that's still their plan. I'm, yeah, yeah, it might still be their plan. I just, there's a lot of history there and shutting it all off. Okay. To me, there might be a sense from the neighbors that live on Lincoln Avenue or Washington Street that, well, why do we have to go a different way? Nobody else has to go a different way. I just, I just like to see if there's anything police-wise. Sure. I'm, I've hit the curb coming around. You know, I'm sure. And when you know, were an also, officer, you may have been there that night that I did hit the curb, but um, uh, but just can you check on those things to see yeah. if there's any compelling vehicular mm -hmm. problem? There? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. And I also think that you should survey the community. Yeah. Okay. Just to see. It's a little different from where we closed off. Lord, what was the name of that street all uh, the way up north? North by uh, uh, Pet uh, Boys. Not Priscilla, but Decatur. 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 Yeah. Oh, North Division. North, North Division. North Division. Division. Yeah. Part of the same oh, street. Same street. Part Decatur. of the same yeah. street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that was because it was the insurance company that came to you and asked, correct? And part, and part of the monument right. thing. Mm -hmm. But State Highway right. wants that one at that close. They want right. all these like weird yeah. angle things. Sure. You know, which well, di well, Division basically slices across the whole city in that yeah. weird angle. But that, the Decatur one was a smart one because a lot of people. Oh yeah, that was that was, was a hazard. All the time. That was a hazard. I'm guilty. You would come off really fast. Raise your hands for sure. I'm guilty. <laughs> Cutting through. Yeah. Also the uh, easy access. The South South Division one down by the hospital is also where the train accident occurred. Yeah. And we will have the rail trail coming through there. There. Yeah. Okay. Soon, so it might help from a pedestrian safety standpoint. To eliminate cars crossing at the same point, potentially. And just we should have drawings of that soon. Yeah. Okay. Just as a recommendation, um, relative to April's point, if someone reads this, mm -hmm. street closures at Route th right. it doesn't okay. really. If you could put down which absolute, streets, yeah, then you might have. <laughs> then we might get the in, the information from the citizens that we're looking for. Okay. In order to help us with our decision. Know. We could do like a Facebook poll or something too. Okay. That's great. We'll get this additional information. And great. Thank That's you very great. much, Amanda. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you, Amanda. I'm here for one more. Oh, one more. <laughs> okay, one more. <laughs> okay. Creating yeah, bike facilities in accordance with bicycle network plan. Okay. So the city adopted the bicycle network plan back on December 13th, 2016. Uh, we received clarification uh, from the legal department to say, did, did that grant us the authority to then carry out all those bike lanes? And in the past, we've come to you, when we add a bike lane on a street, we're changing a public right of way, so we do that via ordinance. So with every single street that we have a bike lane on, we have come and had an individual ordinance saying we're now adding a bike lane on Camden Avenue, we're now adding a bike lane on Riverside. So what is before you now is, is an ordinance to grant us the ability to carry out the bicycle network plan. 
So that would give a, a blanket authority to add bike lanes where noted in that plan. So it, it's, it's, up, it's up to you. We can come individually. This was a, a thought to um, expedite implementation of the plan to grant authority to do so. So the authority would go to infrastructure and development, but it also states we would work with the field operations department if there's any parking issues. So if there's major parking issues, we would come back before you. If it's minor, a few spaces, not much, then, then field ops would have the jurisdiction to be able to change that. So that's, that's what's here to be considered. <coughs> Questions or comments? How many? Where? It's the whole plan, plan that the city adopted, or that the council right. adopted. Um, well, I, I appreciate that, but we did a whole master plan of, of Group 13 that will take years. So not that. Just, right, right. just the bike plan. But I remember when we got the bike plan, that was one of the things that we said, is this like one of those where when we get an opportunity to do something, we're going to go ahead and, and say this is the sure. level of, but still, where? So this, this year, what's under design is improvements to Waverly. As you probably recall, when we did Waverly as shared lanes, that wasn't our preference at the time. That was what we could afford to do. Improvements to Waverly and bike lanes on Eastern Shore Drive, Carroll, and Fitzwater. So those are the ones that are currently in design, as well as the rail trail. And that those are some of the high priority uh, trails that were in this, in this plan. So we're going to start with those, hopefully implementing Waverly and Eastern Shore Drive this year, and then we'll move on to some of the other higher priority ones like Carroll, I mean, I'm sorry, College Avenue, South Boulevard, that type of thing. So we're, we're gonna keep going. They had, um, in the plan, had six different levels of priority. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're starting high and, and we're gonna just keep chipping away at the, at the design and implementation. So is bike facilities bike lanes? It's, it could be cycle tracks, it could be shared lanes, it could be dedicated lanes, it could be a it's hiker bike, it's any of the, anything that accommodates bicycles on that street. So any of the variety of options that we are given in that plan. And the, pl the plan as adopted shows which type on which street in which section. Um, and to give you, like, <clears throat> in priority one, it, as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Are you looking at that plan now? Thirty-six. Oh, Thir Thirty-six. Um, so if you go to you know the infrastructure and development page on the city website and go to bicycle master plan, um, like priority one is. Oh, I'm sorry. Priority one is tw twenty-four sections. Priority two is 12 sections. Um, and they range from small kind of restriping projects all the way through, you know, protected bike lanes. Um, and if I could, these were, we had a series of meetings that was at headquarters yeah. and, the, and, the, and the citizens all were there. I think we had a couple of them, we had like 25 people, 30 people. The, the question uh, is really the, process of going through legal and do we do it right. individually every single piece of legislation for every single well I guess maybe my only question that, that I have on it I mean I understand that even if you came to us you know it's 24 ordinances that we got to right. mm -hmm. figure out something to do. <laughs> <laughs> true um, if you wanna, but yeah if we turn that over is there anything as far as state highway or state state of Maryland that we have to be concerned about as far as turning that over? No, I, I think that the, the whole point of the ordinance each time is because the, you know, the city council really is in control of highways and byways in the city of Salisbury. And when you're gonna make a change like this, you know, it, it should be approved by ordinance. Now, if the bicycle plan has been approved by ordinance and all you're talking about is implementing what's already in the plan. I think it was a resolution. I think it was a resolution. Resolution. Yeah. resolution. Then, you know, that, so. you know, m maybe we should, we're talking, well, we're basically talking about doing the ordinance. Yeah, it was approved I mean, that's, by, that, that's council by resolution, but not by ordinance. That's the, that's the shortcoming. Well, 
Well, but part of it had monetary aspect to it that wasn't clearly defined at the time. Right. Well, it's it's very clearly defined at the time, a cost estimate. However, you know the reality of that. So this would not authorize the expense because right. that's done through the budget. But this would authorize just the change. Of, just anytime you change like a parking condition or anything like that on the street, that's got to be done by ordinance. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. That's why we. If that's why we. These weren't such large areas, Waverly, North, I mean, uh, Eastern, Shore. Eastern Shore Drive. If we were laid out where everything was this width and then it went to this width because of the bikes, but, but it's not, I don't know if it would be helpful to bring it back here or not. I'm not saying one way or the other if it is. I voted for the, for the bike thing, but I, without getting a sense of how many people are using mm -hmm. the existing things that we have, knowing that we build them because more people will come, I don't know whether or not that's happened. I do believe I posed the question several meetings back about trying to find out. I mean, I know you can't put out a little thing there that says you know, you're getting counted as you go past. But I'm, I'm wondering on big ones like this, if you're going to take a lane, mm -hmm. let's right. just say you right. were going to take a lane out of both sides of Eastern Shore Drive, Absolutely. or all of Tower mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. That to me is something that we should have a public hearing about. That's something that's, that's large enough. You know, you want to put them on my street where it's wide enough to put one down, mm -hmm. we could probably get away without having one, but changing, you know, large mm -hmm. things like that. Sure. Uh, much like what you just came to us with a couple mm -hmm. seconds ago. Right. I don't know. If, if the goal is to make it easier on us, I, it doesn't bother me either way, to be honest. I, I like yeah. it. I think the only thing that I have a concern about is if we, you know, this is certainly part of our, part of our duties. Uh, but if we go through and we make a change on a street and a resident starts looking and asking, well, was there an ordinance or did, mm -hmm. did this go to the council? And then they call us and we're like, oh, well, we gave them the authority to do that. And that's the only, that's the only question I have yeah. on where it's still, I don't know. Well, there's, so there's two schools of thought on that. One, there, there is the Salisbury process where you have public input on design and you have a uh, series of forums where people engage in the design process and they say, you know, this is where we live, this is where we work, this is where we shop, you know, this is where it would be easier to commute and then you design a network based on that and then you fund the network and then you build it. Or there's the Baltimore model, which is now known the world over um, uh, and has become sort of an exercise in, and a study in what not to do, which is, um, go street by street, design by design, and then every time someone complains, you rip it out and, and freak out and, uh, you know, the city hall comes and says, we're sorry, we did this, you know, we'll undo it all, and then they spend millions of dollars not only on building it out, but on ripping it up and starting yeah. over. I will say the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee does go through every design with us. Uh, now, they're not public hearings necessarily, but they are open to the public, and, and we do go to them with every single project. And we would either way. Well, let's, let's poll and see where we, where we are. Uh, do we have consensus to do this, uh, April? We'll see it. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. Wait a minute. I'm thinking. <laughs> um, I'm leaning towards doing them individually, and the only reason I am is because we are we are so rapidly changing this and I think that um, and I have no intention of going against the I, I'm just think that from a from a control point of view um, I feel better about 
I don't think any of us want to hold anything up. It's just the fact that I think we could Sorry. probably do it. And it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't bother me to. The only, sure. the only thing that I could say is if we could look at like levels of street, like maybe something like you had said, like Eastern Shore Drive. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, but if you put to, one down, to give Johnson, you, you know, I mean, that's, that's a different thing. To, I don't to give you a sense of adopting an ordinance for every single one of these, I mean, some of these are, uh, the cost estimate for the entire project is $1,000. You know, this, that is a highly unusual expenditure of, you know, you'd spend more money on uh, attorney's fees than, yes. than the entire project, than the implementation of the entire construction project. So do we do it at a... And, and in fact, uh, just on the priority one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 of the 24, are less than $5,000 total project costs. There are a couple big ones like the rail trail, which is also another project you know, was designed, you know, is, is being designed in a, a separate way. Um, but most of them are relatively. So how about we do it this way? Yeah, I mean, how about we do all priority ones and then do them massive and then when we get into the more complicated ones, we do them individually? Maybe even if it's a project like- Just say, well, right now it's ones. When we get ready to go to twos, so do it in six batches. Do it in six batches. I appreciate that because I yeah. appreciate all the work that the bicycle and pedestrian committee did, but I, mm -hmm. I'm not of the impression that a whole lot of people who live in some of these areas where these where these things are going were on those committees. Uh, I still don't I still don't know what the number is of what we originally. I've what we originally did here from here at the university, I still don't know what the number of people it are is, is, English, help me here, is number of people that it are using it. And, and I think uh, it reminds me of the ones on Mount Herman Road when they went in that the county put them in and people came into school screaming at me, you put, where, we're almost, you know, where, first off, where are all the bike riders was the first question. And the, the second was, where's my turn lane in the <laughs> So I, I sort of understood that, but I would still like to go through them, like you said, Jack. Like, yeah, I, well, I, I think that that would, make, that would make me feel better. But the other side of it, I, just to answer your question, I went to all the meetings for the bike, because that's one of my committees. And I will tell you, there is a great cross section. They live all over the city. Um, we have, and, and, and to be frank, um, it was, it was, I gotta, well, how am I going to say this so I don't sound, there were old people and young people there. It wasn't just one age group, put it that way. Um, so I have no, I have a lot of confidence in the, the plan. I'm just saying that I think that if we, if we take it in six and it's, because something may happen, something may come up that, that we just can't anticipate right now. Sure. And um, can, can so I, can I'd I like actually to propose be, something slightly different than that? Sure, than go even, ahead. Than we're, even the six. Um, I don't think the way we're funding it right now, although we're funding a lot, um, I don't think the way we're funding it right now, it would actually be six batches. I think it would probably, we're, we're going slower than that, mm -hmm. um, slightly slower than that. It's going to take longer than six years. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the ideal. Um, so we could do it annual, you know, instead of six, so it'd be like 10 or 12. That's fine. Smaller, I you know, I smaller groups. With that. But that by work? year, you know, each group. Would that work for you? Yeah, that works. You comfortable? Um, Five it is. Okay. That's good. Do it that way. You all right, Jim? Yeah, he's fine. You're fine. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up, uh, we have, now we've had, we have a coming up the second reading of the rubbish abatement, but uh, Everett has some comments he'd like to discuss, so uh, come on up, Everett. Welcome, good afternoon. Oh, good evening. Is it evening? How are you doing? Oh, yeah, it is, almost. So, forgive me, I'm a novice at this. Mm -hmm. um, as you said before, we've gone through a first reading. Mm -hmm. And essentially that first reading, the revision was 
uh, for the rubbish was basically uh, mirrored the grass uh, legislation. And that was set up so that um, essentially it was counting violations. So if your grass was tall, you got a violation letter that counted as one strike. You got a second letter for your grass being tall later on in the season, that was strike two. Then the third time that you had a violation of tall grass, the city no longer sent you letters and they just came out and mowed your grass and sent you a bill. Um, rubbish is just a little bit different than grass. Um, one, uh, rubbish doesn't really have a growing season. It's all year long. Um, both, both are set up on calendar years. Um, and I think it would be more effective and more efficient, uh, cost efficient wise, if instead of counting violations, which would be the warning letters, if you actually count the abatement actions that the city has to take. So for instance, you get a homeowner who receives a letter, says you have rubbish, you have 10 days to remove your rubbish, and he complies with the letter, we go back and it's gone. That should not count as a strike against you. However, if I get the homeowner who does not remove the trash and the city has to contract somebody to go out there and do it or send city workers out there to do it, then that's an abatement action and that should count as a strike. And we do have vacant properties where we get no response. So if I have a vacant lot that has trash flowing <coughs> across it uh, year round. I mean, nobody's gonna respond to the first two letters. I'm gonna take abatement actions through the Housing Community Development Department and or write on citations and strike three on that abatement action would be where I would, the revisions, the new revisions would stop requiring written notices or warning letters. Um, but as long as the the letters are going out and the owners, the homeowners, the property owners, uh, whoever is cleaning it up and complying with the letters, it allows for uh, my department to keep sending more letters out without necessarily having to incur the cost of hiring a contractor to go out. And it saves a whole lot of logistical issues from processing the hiring a contractor to billing out to try to reclaim and or putting a lien on the property. So the revisions are basically set um, that I put in there to basically count abatement actions as opposed to warning letters. Um, the other part of this, and I apologize again for being a novice on this, um, what I have in your computer on the Asana, um, also mirroring the grass legislation was, the first letter was 10 days, second subsequent letters were seven days. For rubbish, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It'd be easier just to keep all the letters at 10 days. By the time you deal with mail, postage, you know, the postal service, you're already cutting out potentially up to three days anyway. So then the homeowner's got seven days to clean up rubbish. Hopefully that gives him a weekend. So that's pretty much the gist of the, uh, the revisions I'm looking at. It's, Again, it needs to be cleaned up just a little bit in the uh, computer from the version that you're looking at. Um, but that is slightly different from uh, the original reading that you had. Makes, those make sense to me. Um, we do have this scheduled for next week, correct? Second reading? Yes. Can you, can, do you have the revisions already done? I do. I just, okay. it would can, be nice to be able to get them to. Uh, can you get them to Mark? Yeah. And then can we get them ahead of time? Now, does anybody else have any other questions about right, it? If we, if we make it about, I, I appreciate your, your wanting to make it good for the department. I want it to be good for the people who live in the neighborhood. I, I don't mean to sound, yes, I do. I do mean to sound like this. Not we're worried about what the, the, the paperwork is. I just need to make sure that if the house that gets it, and if they take care of it, but if they get it again, and we keep having to go back there again, because mm -hmm. 
we made it so the law the law was basically uniform, but that still means that there are people who are living and their property is adjacent to these places that seem to take forever to do it. So I'd be I'd be willing to go along with you on this if we do we still have something in place that a, that makes a reasonable attempt to deal with the problem that's going over and over and over again, whether or not it's being taken care of or not. So is, we, is, is there is there you know one thought that I had if you've got the habitual issues, which is which is right. really what we're we're talking about here, where you you go out in January, you have a problem, they don't take care of it, you abate it. <laughs> a month later, you do it again. You know, at, you know. The question is, at, at what point? At what do, point do are we losing money going out there over and over again? And at what point, yeah. even if they do take care of it, if it happens every two months, mm -hmm. well, where so the for the chronic? For the chronic, that's where the abatement actions kick in. Because if you're, you're chronic, and we do have to do an abatement action. You know, the difference between you complying with the letter and us abating it is a, is a cost efficiency factor with us. We're still going to be writing the letters every time there's a violation. And it's getting that property cleaned up. Um, and obviously it's bringing attention. Uh, your, your concern is probably a lot of times with like the landlord situation. We're notifying the landlords, we're notifying the tenants because we're posting the property and we're also sending the letters to the property owner. Um, so essentially, if you have a chronic person, I guess, that doesn't clean up the yard until um, they get a we, we give them a notice, mm -hmm. I mean, you could potentially have somebody that gets numerous notices during the year that we don't have to take abatement action on, but they still have to clean. In order for them not to get an abatement action, they have to clean it up. Right. So we, but clean, for the up. person who lives next door, whether or not you clean it yeah. up or the person who owns it cleans it up or the tenant cleans it up, still needs to be cleaned up. And if it's going to look like that yeah. three weeks from now. So you're either, we're either going to get compliance through the letters or we get compliance by abating the property itself. And, and then you know, either way, it's going to get cleaned up in a timely uh, manner. Um, and we are going to take pictures each time we go. Yes. When we, when so that because one of the things yeah. that came up, I had it last week, right. one of the things that came up was, well, it's the same stuff. And that's, and that's an issue. And I'm like, well, we take pictures now because that's what we had agreed to do is take and pictures. And that's an issue with uh, rubbish because rubbish is, unlike grass, you know grass is going to grow during the growing season. All you need is water and it's going to grow. If rubbish comes from so many, so many sources, I mean, you have people walking down the street who just have no respect for your property and start throwing litter. And the bacon properties um, seem to collect that litter and then it seems to become an eyesore very quickly. And then you have, you know, you have sometimes you have tenants or people that move out and just decide to leave their stuff out there and they don't come back for it. And that's got to get cleaned up. Or you have a windstorm and you happen to have a fence on your yard that catches all the trash every time the wind blows a certain direction. And in certain neighborhoods, I mean, the code enforcement guys are out there. They're out there. So, I mean, we're, some neighborhoods we're hawking a little bit more than others because, you know, you have higher crime rates. You want to keep those neighborhoods you know, uh, cleaner and the cleaner the neighborhood looks, the, the more perception there is that there's uh, people who care and there's subsequently the crime rate goes down a little bit with that. Could I so, ask a question? Yes. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so you're saying if you go up to a person's home mm -hmm. and you see rubbish, they remove it in the 10 days. Yes. You go back a month later and you see it again, but it's not the same stuff, but you do you consider that as being a chronic? More than no, that, at least one or two times? That would, that would trigger another uh, corrective action letter, warning letter. Yeah. And as long as uh, the resident owner keeps complying with those letters, there's no, there's no abatement action to that. We don't hire a contractor. We don't have to bill them for those services. Um, I mean, essentially, I mean, at what point? And that I was going to. I was going to ask, is there a threshold that you think that the problem will become chronic and then if it were yes. perceived as chronic? We, we it, that's, that's what was and the whole... It, it be, yeah, this is where we're going. And then the question of, of do you cross a threshold of being punitive in order to get compliance? 
uh, you know, what, what is the threshold for it being chronic? And then what becomes our action as a city if we decide that once it's chronic, that we put in some sort of punitive measure? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I don't to believe to. we have that defined currently. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and I mean, I hear what you're saying because if it's getting cleaned up, it's not a problem. But then what I'm hearing my colleagues say going. is if we're constantly going out there. Yes, yeah, to the same place. Well, but that, that hasn't happened some of the yet. That hasn't happened yet. That so before. we could take a conservative what, route and go what with I what would you're go, saying. What I would say is, what I would say is let's strange. go with this, yes. see what happens. If we have an issue, then we can go to step B. And then when we get to step B, we'll actually know which properties are chronic. You'll have You're exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. So I don't know. I, I appreciate that, and it's a wonderful idea. But I spent six years doing nothing but coming up with list after list of properties mm -hmm. that were chronic, and they haven't changed one bit. Yeah, oh, wow. no, they haven't. They haven't changed one I bit. I, if if, if, if if well, we're problem, serious, so we have to be tough. Yeah. I, it's just it's that. Well, it's on vacant yeah. on vacant property, for instance, we raised the fines from yeah. thirty to two hundred. That's the other the other issue, pretty chronic, chronic properties are gonna have steep. other issues besides just rubbish. Amen. They're gonna go I mean right. you're gonna have a multifaceted yeah. Yeah. yeah, because we worked on <laughs> linking police calls and and, mm -hmm. and, and code enforcement issues okay. in so, I mean, Don Kate. How many well, programs back was that? Well and now in the legislation both are both add up to be right. the chronic definition. Right. Mm -hmm. Both contribute to that. That would actually be a good thing to get an update on. Yeah. So yeah, would, yeah we've gone it would, out. So we would face a chronic criteria definition just on rubbish. I just, you know, that would be like an overall, the big picture of the, the property itself, which would include police calls, um, code enforcement calls, any other you know, actions that you believe can be tossed in there. I really feel like if I had to go back to somebody's house, I don't care if they clean it up or not. It's a problem. <laughs> it's a serious problem. It's an issue. That's just how I feel. And you know, because if I have to keep going back to you, and I give you 10 days to clean this up, and then I turn around and come back, and you've got the same, not the same stuff, but you have rubbish there again. Then I go back again after you clean it up the third time, and you have it again, it's an issue. Because that, to me, is chronic. That's chronic. Because actually, they're not respecting the laws. And it's usually not the wind just doesn't like that particular Thank property. You. <laughs> right. not. I mean, there's things that we can take into consideration if we've just gone through a windstorm. I mean, that's, yeah, but course. this is, there's, there's a lot of judgment that goes into these jobs. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, <laughs> and you, a lot of discretion. Let's, as a landlord, if you have a property and you have a problem tenant who starts creating rubbish violations for you um, that are going to go against your property, you're probably, you should be working to probably get that mm -hmm. tenant out. And at that point, the tenant moves out and leaves all the stuff in the yard and you got another violation. Mm -hmm. Now the tenant's gone. But nine times out of ten is the landlord who allow or, or has somebody to come put it out. A for eviction. Well, yeah, right. would, well, and I think there's a process that if the property is in the eviction process, there's... Yes. They're, they're Excuse me, Lynn. Communicating to you that that's going on. One conversation, please, because I'm old and I can't <laughs> follow. But if it's something that's leading up to, you know, hopefully, you know, smart landlords and their contracts have, you know, if a if a property receives a violation or so many violations while they're under contract, that that would put that in jeopardy there, for calls for there are, eviction. And there are a lot with. Uh, clauses in their leases that transfer the um, contract fees for cleanup or citations to the tenant. Yeah. Um, As they should. Yeah. So. Okay. So do we have consensus to take this first step and then the, the recommendations and then we'll see how it goes yeah. and then talk I'm about it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have consensus. Awesome. Thanks, Everett. Thank Good you. job. Thank you. So the, the plan now is to get it to Mark as quickly as possible, yeah. and then we'll hopefully have the second yeah, reading. You yep. still want to see it first yeah. before Based we Based on what you said today, a, a few more changes are still necessary. Yeah. Because I've been, I've been writing yeah. notes. <laughs> okay. yeah. Good. Excellent. Ms. Nichols, we have, you have an item. No, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> Diane um, applied for a uh, scholarship to um, for her registration fees 
um, to be paid through our Maryland Municipal Clerks Association. Mm -hmm. She received $1,066 um, for her registration fees for uh, the uh, international conference. Um, so she is going to Norfolk. And um, we've already received the check and we have deposited it. Um, so it went back into the general fund revenue account number that you see in the memo. And we'd like to transfer that transfer back that. into our account so that we can pay for some of her travel fees associated with it. But all of the registration has been paid for not just the conference, but additional classes um, to work towards her master Excellent. clerk's yep. designation. So, yeah, Fantastic. we're excited. Yep. Fantastic. Jack, they got one on there that says effective listening. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> it does. I see it. It's Saturday, too, Jay. What? Okay. Jake. 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 Okay. I don't know what you said. It says effective don't listening. Write when the don't write that down, <laughs> please. <laughs> That's right. just, just keep score. That's just, okay. Yeah, you got one, so payback. Anyway, um, so any, any issues with moving that up? Okay. Fantastic. Thank All you. All right. Thank you. Uh, go to the order. Anybody? Ah. <laughs> nope. In that case, uh, oh. yes. Susie Cole, the musical, is this week all county, like Comical County, it's school music. All county. Susie the musical. Wicomico High School. Thank you, Mrs. Bratton. Appreciate it very much. By the way, I have to thank Lynn for um, a thought. <laughs> I went to see uh, Calendar Girls at the Warwick Community College, and they have uh, they had one scene where there was a podium with a speaker, and they had a red, green, and yellow light on it. In the next year's budget, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, we are adjourned. Hey.